Hello and welcome to this online worship service for September 13th, 2020 from Shiloh United Methodist Church in Piedmont, South Carolina. My name is Mike Hammett. I'm the pastor here at Shiloh and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Assisting me in this service is David Watson, our Director of Music Ministries. You'll be hearing David on the piano in the musical selections for this service and also the beautiful images that you'll enjoy and all of the other production uh, parts of this service are provided by him as well. So uh, we welcome you today and we hope that you are blessed by this service. We do want to let you know that each Sunday, Shiloh does offer an in-person worship service as well. Uh, that service is presently at 10 a.m. in our church sanctuary where we do observe social distancing. However, we are spiritually close. We also uh, hope that you'll come and join us in that service if you choose to do so. The services are different. There's different uh, sermons, different music in each service, so each can bless you in a different way. And so now as we prepare our hearts and minds to enter into this time of worship, I invite you to listen as David plays for us. Would you bow with me now in a moment of prayer? Lord, though distance separates us in this online worship experience, your spirit keeps us close. We pray now that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and minds to the scripture as they are read and as they are discussed. May the music lift our spirits and may we know that we have been in the presence of the Lord. We ask this in your holy name, amen. Our first reading today from the Hebrew scriptures or what we often call the Old Testament comes from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose stream made glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes waters and wars cease to the end of the earth. 
He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. May God bless this reading from God's holy word. Psalm 46 expresses confidence in God. One commentator put it this way, few psalms breathe the spirit of sturdy confidence in the Lord in the midst of very real dangers as strongly as does this one. Now, we don't know the exact occasion for which Psalm 46 was written, exactly what issues the Hebrew people were facing. But we do know that its robust tone suggests that even in a time of crisis, a confession of faith is a good one to make. You see, this psalm basically lets us know that our God is supreme over nature, our God is supreme over nations, and our God is supreme over the earth. Verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And that word refuge refers to a shelter or a rock of refuge. So when we are facing difficult troubles and crises, the storm shelter to which we should run, the rock upon which we should stand and build is that rock of God. And we know that our God is supreme over the nations. It talks about the, the city of God, which would be heaven, and also the city of God, the new Jerusalem, which will one day be upon the earth. And it talks about how there's a river whose streams make glad the city, that God is in the midst of her and shall not be moved. So for believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, as citizens of the city of God, we know that things are sturdy for us. I love verse seven that reminds us, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And we also understand that God is supreme over the earth. Those last few verses talk about how God will make all the wars cease. That God will at one day just be the Lord over all, as all will bow before God. How are we to experience that? The final verse reminds us, be still and know that I am God. So I want you to listen for just a moment to the Mike Hammett abridged version of Psalm 46. Verse one, then verse seven, then verse 10. And I believe that you're going to find that when you place those three verses back to back like this, it is a beautiful affirmation. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Amen and amen.
Our second reading from Holy Scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, reading verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, referring to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God bless these readings of these difficult words from our Lord Jesus. Amen. The power of forgiveness. It is an interesting fact that Unforgiveness, anger, resentment, frustrations that we hold can often have very dire consequences. A man went to his doctor because he was having all kinds of illness problems. This was a man who had been raised in a dysfunctional family. He was furious with all of his family, immediate and extended. He was in what he called a bad marriage. He had been cheated by a business partner. He'd lost a lot of his money. Now he was extremely ill. And his doctor said quite bluntly to him, you're going to die. Your system is shot. It's just like a worn out car. Everything's gone. My best medical opinion is that you've got about six months to live. So you should make peace with whomever or whatever in your life. Because there's nothing more that modern medicine can do for you. And this doctor, who happened to be one of those wonderful doctors who actually knew the patient fairly well, had taken the time to get to know his patient, said, you might choose to forgive some people. You're still so angry at so many people, just let them go. Well, the man walked out of that meeting with his doctor and began thinking, yes, I have been angry for a long time. So he made a list of 39 people that he was absolutely furious with. And he said, okay, I'm going to forgive these people. So one by one, he went down the list. He thought about why he had been angry with them, and he forgave them. He said, I forgive this person completely. Some of the names were hard, but he went through. Some of the people, he had to call them. Some of the people, he actually traveled to see them. For six months, he worked at forgiving these people and asking for their forgiveness. And here's the amazing thing. As he did it, 
his health got better, much better. By the end of six months, he had forgiven every single person that had ever hurt him, all those 39 people on that list. His mind, his soul, his heart were completely clear. He no longer had negative feelings. He felt fabulous about himself. He realized he didn't have any pains. And he went back to the doctor and the doctor couldn't believe it and said, you're symptom free. Everything that I told you was wrong with you has corrected itself. Meanwhile, the man resumed working, made back all the money he had lost and even more. Our gospel today teaches us that forgiveness is releasing an offending person from a debt we feel they owe us, whether it's money or something that they've done or said, and allowing our negative feelings, thoughts, and behaviors to change, sometimes gradually, sometimes instantly, into positive ones. That is, we change internally. The Greek word for forgiveness can literally be translated as to loose, to let go, to release, or to omit. Now, do you notice that twice we have the same phrase in that passage, be patient with me and I will pay you back in full, both of these people that owed money said. Well, to the master, when that was said, the master said, I will forgive you. And then that same forgiven person would not forgive someone else. And the, the master said well to the unforgiving servant, should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? But you see, here's a key. People are in favor of forgiveness, at least in principle, but the great Christian writer and theologian C.S. Lewis put it well. He said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until there's something or someone to forgive. So what is Jesus trying to tell us in this parable? Remember, parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. So what's Jesus trying to tell us in this parable? Well, he's saying don't limit forgiveness. Don't limit grace. Don't limit mercy. Now, I can't believe I'm the only one in the sound of my voice who messes this up almost every day. How many of you, like me, sometimes think the wrong thought at least once a day? How many of you, like me, can admit that you've probably done the wrong thing today at some point or said the wrong thing? What if God decided I'm only gonna forgive you X amount of times, once, five times, 10 times, seven times. Oh, even if he said 77 times, which by the way, when Jesus said that, it meant just keep forgiving always. It was a phrase that was used in that day to just mean you keep doing it forever. But what if God said, no, I'm really gonna limit how many times you can be forgiven. And when you use them up, that's tough. Well, we wouldn't want that, would we? We don't ever want God to give up on us. We don't ever want God to not forgive us, not show us mercy, not show us grace. Well, then the question becomes this. Why are we so willing not to show forgiveness and mercy and grace to others? Well, you say, preacher, you just don't know what they did to me, what they said about me. Well, the truth is that every time we commit a sin, it affects our relationship with God. It hurts God. It puts a division between ourselves and God. And being unforgiving is a sin. Jesus clearly tells us that. We need to ask to be delivered from unforgiveness. We need to ask for the grace to be big enough to forgive others. We need to ask for mercy to be experienced in our own lives and for us to show it to others. Because what people have done to you and me is nothing compared to the great sins that have been committed against God and yet God has more than willing to forgive us over and over again. So the idea here is that we know we need forgiveness and we know that we need forgiveness for things we've done against God. 
And if God's willing to forgive us, then we need to be willing to forgive others. Now, I know some of you are going to say, preacher, I'm not going to forgive them. They're going to need to apologize to me first. They owe me an apology. Friends, we need to be a people who forgive because we've been forgiven. As God has forgiven us, so we need to be willing to forgive others. You need to release them from the debt you think they owe to you because you've been forgiven a great debt that you owed to God. When we let unforgiveness, anger, bitterness, resentment get into us, it's like we're being tortured. Our stomachs get torn up. Our blood pressure rises. We stew. In a good South Louisiana phrase, we boudet. It's bad for us. It's not a happy thing. When you see somebody and you just relive an incident between you that was years and years ago and get all worked up about it again, no. In the popular words of a song from a movie of recent years, let it go. Let it go. Now, I'm not saying that you're always going to forget what they did. And I'm not saying that you may not have some feelings of hurt and understand the betrayal that some people did for you. But until we forgive and are willing to release those things, there's never a hope any of that's ever going to go away. Now, we know that sometimes it's people close to us that hurt us. You know, Peter said, Lord, how often shall my brother, meaning a fellow believer, sin against me? But if we will begin to ask Jesus to help us forgive others and to show mercy and grace toward others, if we will find ourselves in the position to love those individuals once again, then we will find ourselves offering love instead of hate, grace instead of disapproval, mercy instead of forgiveness. Now remember, forgiveness doesn't always come easy. It can take sacrifice. It took sacrifice for God to give us life. It took sacrifice for God to give us mercy. So here's your takeaway. Here's the thing I don't want you to forget. The one thing I want you to remember, if you remember nothing else from this entire service and this entire message I have shared, and it is this. Forgive and feel better. Yes, forgive and feel better. Now, I can't guarantee that every problem you have medically is going to resolve when you forgive people. But I can assure you that you can be a calmer, more centered, and balanced person. That you will be following the teachings of Jesus to love and be loved. You will begin relieving some of the own suffering in your spirit and, yes, in your body that unresolved anger and resentment and unforgiveness can give. Because if we're going to find joy in our life and peace in our life, we're going to have to forgive. We cannot put a limit on how many times we forgive. We need to forgive them and let God work it out. We need to forgive them and see what grace can do. Because grace can change a person. And grace not only changes the person to whom it is offered, but also the person who is offering it. That person that needs to be changed by your offer of forgiveness might just be you. Oh Lord, thank you for your word which has spoken to us today. May we be a people who firmly understand that you are the rock and the refuge, the shelter in which we abide in times of trouble. And may we remember the power of forgiveness, that we can forgive others as you have forgiven us. And we can forgive and feel better. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. I invite you to again turn to a time of prayer. 
as I'm going to pray together on our behalf for our world and our situations. And then at the end of this prayer time, we will pray together the Lord's Prayer, and you can say it aloud where you are, or you can pray it silently to yourself as we pray that together. But first, please go to the Lord now in the spirit of prayer with me. Lord, we give you praise. We come to give you honor. We come to acknowledge that without you, our lives are not as rich and fulfilled and joyful as they could be. We're so thankful that in Christ you have given us the way to eternal life, that in Christ you've given us lessons and experiences that can help us to enjoy this life and experience it with joy and happiness even as we can bless others in your name. For truly, we do believe that we are blessed to be a blessing. And Lord, we remember now those that need our prayers. We remember those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. We remember those who grieve in the loss of loved ones or the illness of family and friends. We remember those who are in the hospital. We remember those who are experiencing disease from the COVID-19 virus. We think about those who are serving on the front lines of medicine and, and the health services. We think about those who serve us as police and fire and EMS. Oh Lord, in each and every circumstance and need and for each person that we think about and call to our mind even now or name before you in our hearts, may you give peace and comfort and strength. May you give the, the grace that passes all understanding. May you bring healing of body, mind, and spirit. And oh Lord, we pray for those in leadership of our school systems and those who teach and all of our students. We pray for all those who are in government at every level from local through the state to our nation and yes, Lord, even for those through our United Nations who, who seek to guide the world stage, may we always seek to make this world the heaven on earth that you have promised to us. And oh Lord, we come as individuals, always needing your grace, always seeking your love and your presence. And we thank you that you hold us in your arms, that you cover us with your grace, and that you fill us with your spirit. And now, O oh Lord, all of these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One day I'll tell you the story of why I like to say forever and ever, amen, and not just forever, amen, as the text does. And it has to do with the example of a wonderful, godly old pastor that was in my church when I was growing up as a child. I'll tell you that story one day soon. Now, as David again plays a beautiful hymn of the faith for us, just relax and know that God's got you in the palm of God's hand.
now, my friends, this online service is ending, but our time of being blessed and being a blessing to others for God is just beginning. May you go in peace, and may the peace of Christ always go with you. And give us a call here at Shiloh if we can do anything for you or yours. God bless. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.